Hello, and welcome to another IBMS pod. In this episode, we catch up with Headley Glencross, a retired lead biomedical scientist in cytology and andrology. But Headley's retirement is every bit as busy as most people's full time jobs, and he's still involved in portfolio assessments, mentoring, and an incredible Moldovan cervical screening program. This episode was recorded when we caught up with Headley at IBMS Congress earlier this year. So apologies for any distracting background noise and chatter. Right, let's jump straight into the conversation. We're here with Headley Glencross. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Jordan, and thank you for inviting me to contribute. Um, no problem. Just tell you a little bit about myself, if yeah. you like, first, first up. Um, I'm actually now retired after 44 years working as a biomedical scientist, both in the NHS laboratory and the period working at IBMS HQ as well. Um, I'm a trained histologist, but I'm probably most recognised as being a cytologist, having been not only an IBMS council member, but also the specialist advisor for cytopathology and the organiser of the cytology programme for the Congress in 2003. Mm. And could you tell us a little bit about your career journey? And where did your passion for biomedical science originate? Okay, my career journey, shall I, shall I say, I graduated from university in 1977. And for those who are either old enough or have been told by their mums and dads that at that point, work for graduates was very hard to find. Yeah, and yeah. I got a job as what was just changed from being what was known as a medical laboratory technician to a medical laboratory scientific officer in Southampton. And as I'd been offered the job, I thought I ought to take it really, because I don't know if I wait a year to do some more study, I'd have the same opportunity. Mm. So I didn't seek out laboratory work, laboratory work found me. I worked in histology, which for those who, who know, it's about either surgical or post-mortem tissue taken out of the body and you process it and cut sections and make diagnoses. Um, and I think my first week, I wondered whether I'd actually done the right thing because I wasn't quite sure. I was what was your ideal career? What, what, what was the alternative? What did you want to be in? Well, alternatively, like a lot of people, I would have loved to have done medicine. But medicine mm. is highly competitive and what have you. And you, you, know, you have to have really high grades of A-levels and stuff like that. And while I had good grades at A-levels, they weren't good enough. But obviously, I had an inkling that I wanted to do something medical. Okay, so I trained in histology um, and the, um, uh, the laboratory there, or the department there, it also had a standalone neuropathology laboratory. And a job came up there and I applied for it and I got it. So that is neurohistology, so that's more specialised. It's dealing with brains, basically, and they had um, the, all the plastic surgery work, so we would get small biopsies from the eye and things like that. Okay. And we would do muscle biopsies and uh, nerve biopsies and whole eyes as well. So, yeah, very specialised. Um, and... Within that, um, when someone has a brain tumour, or they think they've got a brain tumour, and they're, they're going to operate, um, they either open up the skull, which is known as a craniotomy, yeah. or they can drill a hole in the skull and put some, pull, pull some tissue out. Mm. And that's called a burr hole biopsy. And what you would do is you would take the fresh tissue and you'd freeze that solid and cut a section 
you known as the frozen section again, people who yeah. now know what it is. Yeah. But also what we used to do because the brain has no connective tissue, we would we would take a piece of the tumor, put it on a slide, put a second slide on it, and pull them apart and make what's known a brain smear, which is my first introduction to cytology as opposed to histology. Yeah. And that did spark a uh, a thing in me and I then applied, I passed an exam so I could apply for a senior's post and I actively sought out a senior's post that had both histology and cytology and little by little I became much more of a cytologist than a histologist and that's how people probably know and recognize me. What was it about cytology that you loved so much? Well, the, 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 the thing with histology is, yes, there's a lot of process and you do a lot of work, but then you give it to someone to make a diagnosis, someone called a pathologist. In cytology, you get to look at what you've done and you can make opinions and stuff like that. So that's really what attracted me Okay, so like being in charge of the whole, more of the process. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yes, yeah. yes. And you actually worked at one point in your career for the IBMS. What I was did. behind the move to the IBMS? That's a really good question. Um, I was at a point in my career where I thought that, um, that I ought to find a job that's going to see me out to the end of my career. I'd actually thought that two jobs previously. Uh, how old were you at this point when you were thinking about uh, the end of your career? Where are we? I was probably 50 at that point. Okay. So, you know, and I thought actually there was a lot of work going on around development of examinations about we were beginning to, to start to examine the concept of advanced or expert practice and what have you so I thought that would be really useful to do because I've taught and trained all my working life and what have you and I just thought I would be really good at developing those qualifications writing the curricula and the guidance and what have you and there's some of them that probably had about 10 different iterations where I would look at it and think, no, that's stupid, we've got to rewrite that, you know. <laughs> yeah. We can write that a lot better. So, you know, it was honing the, the, the thing. Much as um, Rob and I discussed very previously about scientific writing, getting it down as succinctly and as accurately as possible so it's easy to understand, you know, when we say do this, that's what we mean, not... Yeah, you don't want any ambiguity yes, in scientific yeah. writing. So it's guiding people through that process with that, that sort of level of, of thing. Mm. Um, I also um, did other things that you would never do if you worked in a laboratory or what have right. you. Um, what were they? It, it, well... One of the big things was that, uh, and it came from Congress, and it was about printing a lanyard. The old IBMS logo, it had its lines across the IBMS. So when this was printed on the lanyard, it was sort of a whitish or blackish blob rather than right. that. So um, Bob, who isn't here today, but from Step Exhibition said, can we do something about it? And he just drew something that looks not too dissimilar to what this is here uh, now. Um, and I said, I'm sure we can do that. And he said, well, can I use it? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why not? I said, if we're going to redesign the logo, then we're going to have it properly drawn by a, by a professional person we have all the right EPS files with Pantone and CYMK and stuff like that you know um, 
I sort of went, oh, all right then. And in the process, I got, um, as you know, the, the printers in um, it, 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 the, the, uh, IBM SUs, Heron, they did all the work. And then and at the point of that as well, we'd never trademarked the logo, so I got them to do the trademark application as well. So it is a registered trademark. Nice. And in doing so, again, a lot of our portfolios and publications had no disclaimer on them. So again, I worked with the lawyers and what have you, and we wrote the disclaimer. Yeah. So now the disclaimer says that the logo and the trademark and property of the IBMS and you've got to have permission, blah, 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 yeah? yeah? Which we've never had before. And, and it was always something that irked me is that other professions used to steal our work, present it as their own, or take it out of context to bash us with. So at least now, if it's copyrighted and stuff, we can, it says so, we can, we can at least say, oi, don't do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's some protections in place. But it's a whole different thing, you know, you know, getting involved with that sort of thing, you know? And, and, and I, I agonized over the font to use with the logo as well. And there are a number of things where it's got one font and one size and what have yeah. you, before we finally lit upon that one, which is the one that we see now. Mm. How will you feel in, say, 20 years time if the IBM has decided to do a brand refresh and your legacy's gone heavily? <laughs> I'd say fair play to them. <laughs> because nothing stands still. Yeah. I believe what we've got now actually works, and I'm very, I'm, I'm really um, proud of it as well. It, it, it's cleaner and it's nicer. The other one was all right, but it could be better. But you may want to change it, and that's fine. Yeah. They may want to change their name and have a whole new logo. Mm. It's possible, mm. isn't it? You know, so, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> So, you know, you get involved in things that are associated with being a biomedical scientist, but not what traditionally a biomedical scientist would do. Yeah. Mm. And I enjoyed that, you know. Um, and I guess the other thing that occurred when I worked there was that when I was a council member, um, I agreed and voted on a request from Oxford University Press to use our logo on a book series that they were considering to, to, to develop and publish. And um, at that time we said, yeah, that's fine, but do you want to involve us to help you writing it as it's clean all fundamentals of biomedical science? Yeah, yeah. Well, about two years later when I was working at the IBMS, not a lot had happened on that project. And that was a project that was given to me by, uh, again, the chief executive, Alan Potter at the time. And I worked with OUP, with the advisory panels, with obviously my having been a specialist advisor hat on, being able to speak their speak and understand what they were going through. And well, I don't know how many volumes and how many editions there are now, including one co-edited and co-authored by myself. So, you know, that was quite nice, you know, uh, to get that. But, but they are now, you know, internationally recognized as standard texts, you know, so I've helped in a massive way to get that series both written and established Originally, the the impetus was to have an undergraduate book, and I said, "But that's fine. But why don't you have a book that you can use when you're studying, but a book that you can take into your first job and it's still relevant and useful on the bench?" Brilliant. So that's how it is. So it's it's undergraduate plus, yeah. you know. And while we're looking at things that have an international impact. Can you tell us a bit about your project in Moldova? That's uh, oh, very important. Okay, fine. Well, um, 
around five years ago, um, I was at that point um, working back in a lab in a uh, cervical screening program lab and I was an executive member of the um, BAC, the British Association for Cytopathology and we had an email sent to us from uh, uh, a guy called Philip Davis about a issue he was having in a country called Moldova and wanted to know if we could help him. Well, what he asked, I knew the answer for, so I responded. And I got a email back saying, thank you for that. Now what about this? And we started to develop a ongoing, more regular and more um, <laughs> ever increasingly um, complex set of emails about things um, and it culminated that in, in June of that year um, they were conducting some laboratory assessments on the back of uh, another a, a teaching session going out there and, and Philip said to me by email he said it's no good you, you assessing remotely would you like to come out and I said well if you'll have me, it took about half a second to say yes, you know. <laughs> and I spent a week out there assessing laboratories, you know. And nothing could prepare me for what I saw day one. So, so what were the issues in Moldova? Well, the issues in Moldova, it, it relates to um, um, everyone knows that we do... Um, a cervical smear it's called still even though it isn't um, although it may be uh, and it's stained by a method called Papanicolau and, and everywhere in the world probably apart from the UK it's known by it's an Americanism called the Pap test yeah. okay so that's how they know it in Romania almost exactly within weeks of Papa Nicolau publishing his original paper, there was a Romanian pathologist called Oral Babish who published the paper using air dried smears and Romanowski Gimsa staining to diagnose cervical cancer. Mm. Almost exact, you know, two independent thoughts. Well, Babish published in a French speaking journal and did no further work on it. So it sort of disappeared without a trace, yeah. basically, except after the Second World War, when we had the Iron Curtain, very relevant now, when we had the Iron Curtain. So in Soviet countries, and those that were part of the Warsaw Pact, mm -hmm. this persisted. And it was no... Um, it, 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 after the breakup of the Soviet Union, they still used it, but they realised that you know it wasn't just that way of doing it. You could do it by Papanicolau, and it was known as the Babish Papanicolau test. In in that thing, so I I rocked up and I saw air dried Romanowski Gimsa stain sites that, frankly you couldn't do anything with, they were not going to help you mm. do anything because you couldn't identify what we wanted, which was the pre-invasive component of the disease, which a pap stain smear or, or sample will do. So we had to sort of explain to them gently, you need to start papanicolate staining and, and stuff like this. So. You know, we have the issue then of, you know, the, the little and big P politics and the cultural things and working through translators yeah, and what have you. Mm -hmm. And what makes you an expert, why are you to you know, you know, But gently and what have you, we have converted a number of laboratories into doing a Papanicolaou stain sample and that's what they do now. 
and they've been given a working method and working recommendations on what reagents to use, not the ones that they can source on, you know, from the back of a um, hand cut somewhere in some market. You have proper stuff. And I have to say, in particular, uh, the company Cellpack were really good at sourcing stuff for us because yeah. I specified we need cell path reagents and they, they sorted it out because getting it from the EU to the non-EU country and that is, you know, because you're, you're, you're transporting alcohol over national borders yeah, and things like, you know. So they were really good and, and, and they're, they're doing that now. So uh, as apart from that, I also went back a year later to, uh, to co-deliver a two-week training course. I worked with a um, UK pathologist, someone called Dr. Mary Brett, and what we did was we modified the four-week introductory course that we would do in the UK. We modified that so we could deliver it in a two-week thing because some of it wasn't relevant, but you know, the bit about what is and what isn't an abnormal cell and stuff like that. We kept that in. So we delivered that over a two week period and then did a, uh, in 2019, did another follow up week as well. So my sort of role is to both, you know, look after the scientific bits, but also to deliver some of the teaching training and slide reviews and stuff like that. Mm. And it's been ongoing for five years. Um, it's, it's probably the better part of a 10 year project because what we eventually want to do is be able to say, you know what you're doing now. Yeah. We will leave you alone, but we'll be here if you want us. But, you know, and if you want to invite us out to say hello and that, you know, we'll come, but we won't interfere anymore because they can look after themselves. So it's about giving them the skills, the knowledge, the competence, and the confidence, which is the really important bit, to run with it by themselves. And while we're talking about psychology and some yeah. of the techniques that are being used, for anyone considering a career in that area of the profession, as a student or thinking about moving into psychology, can you just tell us a little bit about what actually is cytology? <laughs> okay. And then um, I know during the pandemic as well, it's been, there's been some movement away from the cytology discipline to help with the COVID testing. So, Okay, all right. Um, that's a relatively easy one to say, mm. but also it might be a slightly long-winded answer <laughs> as well. <laughs> because there's so many little bits of information and little mm, bits of, of things. Now, when I started in cytology, there wasn't such a thing called an NHS cervical screening program, yet all laboratories or most cytology laboratories were looking at cervical smits, usually as part of some localized thing. In 1988 was when it was organized as a nationwide, and, it, and at that point, that was England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. So it was a UK national screening program. And that drove cytology laboratories considerably. Mm. That was their raison d'etre. Coupled with that, you would have also diagnostic cytology and that's where if someone has a lump or a bump they'll put a needle into it suck some material out or they'll brush it or they'll um, uh, if you've got fluid on the lung they'll drain the fluid that sort of thing you would prepare those samples as well and and although cervical cytology is wonderful and I, I love it and I never understand why medical staff don't love it. I can't, I just cannot get that into my, my, my brain, but they don't like it. But diagnostic cytology is even more interesting because there's so many things to do, to learn, to look at, to 
discover and, and what have you. But diagnostic cytology was always a junior partner to the cervical screening program. Yeah. Well, what happened over the period of about um, 2018 to 2019, um, there was a move from, we'd moved from what was known as conventional cytology, which was taking a sample and smearing it on a slide and fixing it and sending it to what's known as liquid-based cytology or LBC, where you take the sample and then you suspend it in some yeah. fluid and you make a sample back mm -hmm. in the lab. And that's sort of one, one thing. And hot on the heels of that came the introduction of human papillomavirus testing as a reflex test. So those, those slides that we thought were abnormal would have an HPV test done. That was done by real-time polymerase chain reaction mostly. There were other ones, but eventually it was really a PCR test that, yeah. that, that, that people used. And based on the result of the HPV test would um, determine whether a woman was referred for further investigation or sent back to have another sample done in a shorter time than the normal screening thing. And during 2018, 2019, there was a move to swap that around. So the screening test would become the HPV test and the reflex test would be the cytology. Okay. Right. And again, there's big and little p politics involved. What it meant was that of around 50 laboratories in England that were doing cervical screening work, on a slide basis thing, that was gonna be reduced to a maximum of 13. It turned out that they offered nine centralized areas to do the HPV testing, which became eight because one of them bid for another uh, workload and got it. So, so there are eight laboratories now do HPV testing. So, Cytology now is very much based on diagnostic cytology. Mm. It is a or was a junior partner, but in the interim, with the advent of next generation sequencing, molecular biology and what have you, the information you can get from a cytology sample is almost limitless. Yeah. And cytology by its very nature, is less invasive. It's easier to do, easier to handle than doing a tissue biopsy. And we're at a crux now whereby it's up to us, well, sorry guys, you, because I'm no longer one of us <laughs> in that respect, but it's up to us to take that on board and work with it and run with it yeah. and convert cytology into a true or reconvert it back into a true clinical discipline that is used and appreciated by the clinicians and if you want what's what's the attraction for cytology well that to me is the attraction for the cytology you will be you can hopefully make it part of the patient pathway and you're going to be involved in the patient pathway not as a passive partner but as an active partner and how has cytology fared in the pandemic well again in the pandemic of course that occurred at the time when as i said in england we went from 50 labs to yeah. eight in scotland they went from five labs to two and in wales i think they went from three to one uh, Northern Ireland is still yet to do it, but basically the number of labs across the UK shrunk massively. But what happened, of course, is because we've been doing real-time PCR for HPV anyhow, the people with those skills were 
almost immediately um, encouraged to go and help out their microbiology colleagues to do real-time PCR for COVID-19 rather than yeah, HPV. Right. They had the skills and in some cases the equipment was exactly the same so it was a natural fit and because we weren't seeing as many patients because they weren't being admitted to hospital we had a reduction in workload so we didn't suffer by not being able to process people by letting them go but it showed how as a profession that we could adapt and adapt literally almost overnight to be able to support our colleagues in other disciplines and what have you. And I think it's a real credit to a lot of people mm. who did that. And in fact, some of them enjoyed it so much they stayed. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a project in the pipeline coming up in Kazakhstan. Mm, well. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Well, it, it's nice you say a project. What... Um, what I've heard, and this is still under the radar to some extent, that the Kazakhs have, have recognised that their screening programme appears not to be identifying uh, the right amount of people as being abnormal. They're, they're, again, for those in the in, in the know, it's what is known as undercalling. You know, they think they're undercalling a lot of yeah. high grade disease. Now, to understand that, you've sort of got to dig a bit deeper. There could be many reasons, but one of the reasons is that they're truly undercalling. They're not recognizing what is on the side that they should be recognizing. So, to rule that in or out, um, I've been asked in principle if I could um, help undertake some slide reviews from slides made and stained in Kazakhstan. So that's sort of where it's sitting at the moment, but the reality is if they are undercalling um, and it's not to do with the population they're screening or the epidemiology of that population, that would sort of intimate that we would need to go and help them, which would be doing some delivering courses and training and teaching and yeah. site reviews and one-to-one. -one. So that's potentially what's going to happen, but that is very much um, dependent on many factors, but we will see how that, that proceeds. Brilliant. It sounds like your retirement is going to be more busy than my working life, Hadley. <laughs> but, it's, but it's good work I mean I've worked 44 years and and I've, like I said I've taught and trained all my working life you know I've sort of given back as much as I've got out of the profession but you know this is an opportunity to really give something back yeah. you know you know I'm not just sort of you know developing a few people I'm actually going to be helping to you know provide a whole country with an important public health initiative, you know? Yeah. That is going to save many, many lives. People I'll never know or meet, but... But you'll so have a what? tangible impact. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I hope so. I oh, almost said no. the uh, B word then. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to end off, we've got a quick fire round, Heather. Okay, quick. Which fire. is where I'm going to say three sentences, or half of three sentences, okay. and then you can finish the sentence for okay, me. Okie okay. The first one is, the best thing about my job, or previous job, as it, as it were, is... And I'm going to answer it very succinctly, almost everything. Perfect. Because, and I'll just qualify it, Yes, there's a mundaneness about working, but you know, you, you you've seen from what I've told you and what I haven't told you that that you you haven't seen or don't know that I've done in my life as well. Gives you lots of opportunities just by doing your job, doing it well, and sticking your head above the parapet maybe, and being a bit annoying here and there, and 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 people will come and find you. The proudest moments of my career so far 
is? That's a really interesting one, because I'm not sure whether the proudest moment of my career has happened yet in that respect. Um, and that requires me to be, you know, big my own self up somewhat. Um, I suppose the proudest moment I would say is um, when, as a council member, um, one of the things that you could become, you could become president of the Institute, which would be a pretty high end and, and proud moment. But in doing so, you tend to serve a, a apprenticeship, if, if for want of a better word, you know, being a chairman of a standing committee. Well, you know, it's when my professional peers said, Headley, we'd like you to be chairman of science committee, you know, that, you know, you sort of think, well, thanks guys, that's really lovely, but it's also humbling that they think I'm yeah. good enough because I'm pretty certain I wasn't, but you know. <laughs> yeah. You're too modest, Headley, but we'll end on one quick one. <laughs> the one piece of advice I'd give a budding cytologist is? Well, can I, can I slightly, um, alter the question you and say, can. say a budding biomedical scientist yes, rather indeed. than a budding cytologist. Um, a, 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 a budding biomedical scientist, really, I, the advice I'd give them is encapsulated in the Institute's motto, which in English says, learn that you may improve. Always learn, always improve. Try and do your best. Even if you louse up, if you've done your best, learn from it why you loused up, that sort of thing. So your best might be a little better next time, that sort of thing, you know? So always, always, and here I am retired and I'm still learning things and still trying to improve myself. Absolutely. That's a great note to end on. Headley Glencross, thank you so much for joining us. Brilliant, guys, and thank you for uh, inviting me. I hope I haven't... Thank you, Hedley. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. These podcasts are released monthly at the same time the magazine comes out, so whenever a new issue lands on your doormat, head back online to listen to a new episode. And don't forget that these podcasts can be used for your CPD. Take care and bye. <laughs>